Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm trying to calculate the distance to the sun, as explained here and in various other websites. Various scientists have in the past tried to calculate the distance of various celestial bodies from the Earth. They have, however, done this by assuming a number of factors which could be false. One, the Earth is a convex ball, and two, the Earth and planets revolve around the sun. I could add a third that uh, light travels in straight lines. So I wonder, is there a way to calculate the distance to the sun without assuming that the Earth is revolving around the sun? I would assume initially that the Earth is indeed a sphere. This is the heliocentric Copernican model of our solar system, and this is what we've all learned at school as being the truth. For my experiment, I wanted to choose a date that would aid me in making correct trigonometric calculations. For this reason, I chose one of the four turning points in our seasons. Each of these four turning points is well known as we experience them yearly. The method I used is simple, but before we proceed to the method, you have to have some basic understanding of how this model works. An important factor in this method is the ecliptic plane, as shown here in the diagram. You can imagine this as a surface of a lake on which the Earth and the Sun float. Half of the spheres appear below the surface, and half of the spheres appear above the surface of the lake. All trigonometric calculations will be made on the surface in order to get proper two-dimensional triangles. This is a top-down view of the heliocentric model of our solar system. The ecliptic plane is now your screen, it's like viewing the lake from the air. And as we can see, only half the sun and half the earth are protruding above the lake. Keeping it simple, the method is to take measurements of angles to the sun from various places on the surface of the earth, as shown. The diameter of the earth is well known, so having formed some sort of triangle, we should be able to easily calculate even roughly the distance to the sun, assuming that the earth is a sphere. Then we can see if this answer is similar to the official one. Trying to calculate the distance to the Sun, I chose June 21st for convenience. On this special day, the summer solstice, the Sun is highest on the Tropic of Cancer in the Northern Hemisphere. This is in fact what we observe. The green dotted line is a great circle that cuts the Earth exactly in half. It's on the ecliptic plane. And on this particular day, June 21st, it lines up perfectly with the Sun. This means that the plane that cuts the Earth in half also cuts the Sun in half. Therefore, we can use trigonometry to find the distance to the Sun using only an elevation angles and Earth distances which we know without making any further assumptions. Please note that atmospheric refraction, although negligible, will be addressed later on. I choose points on this great circle at regular angular distances from the prime meridian base in Greenwich, London. This is the prime meridian. Each point is 22 and a half degrees from the previous one, going all the way around the globe 180 degrees. All points chosen receive sunlight at 6 a.m. London time on June 21st. These are the coordinates of each point and the elevation data is provided by two different sources, the NOAA Solar Position Calculator and the PSA algorithm for high accuracy tracking of the Sun. The solar elevation angle is the altitude of the Sun, the angle between the horizon and the center of the Sun's disk. What we expect to find? We can all agree that all light sources have only one center, no matter how big and how far they are. We should also agree that since refraction is zero at 90 degree angles perpendicular to a denser medium, like the atmosphere, then when we see the center of the sun directly overhead at 90 degrees, it most certainly should be directly overhead and nowhere else. We can therefore also agree that when the sun is directly over D, all other points should be measuring elevation angles leaning towards the D perpendicular and away from their own perpendicular black dotted lines. And this is not accounting for atmospheric refraction. The elevation angles calculated are as follows from the PSA and from NOAA respectively. As mentioned before, all elevation angles are observed simultaneously at 6 o'clock, June 21st, for each of the seven locations plotted. So we have these elevation angles and we plot them on our great circle from point A all the way around to G. Now from physics, we know that the light source, if the light source was gazillions of kilometers away from the Earth and its size was also immense, then physics teaches us that we can depict the light coming from the source with a set of parallel lines. This is, of course, a fairy tale. Our sun is not that huge and it's not that far away, and actually astrophysics has placed our sun inside our solar system and has estimated its distance and size. It stands to reason that we should be able to triangulate its position, however, this is where things turn weird on June 21st, we cannot form a triangle. As you can see from the plotted graph, where we see the elevation angles, we see that the elevation angles at each point is pointing away from the perpendicular at point D. If we're calculating elevation angles pointing towards the center of the sun disk, then how is this possible? East of point D, the sun deviates to the left of the parallel black lines, and west of point D, the sun deviates to the right of the parallel black lines. The angles of incidence should have a tendency towards the center point D. On the contrary, what we observe is a huge tendency away from the center point D. 
And this is, of course, impossible. Elevation of the Sun at each point examined seems to give a greatly away from where the Sun is expected to be. The elevation angles west of D should never be larger than the longitude of each location, whilst east of D they should never be larger than 180 minus the longitude of each location. It is impossible to calculate the distance to the Sun using the convex model. The elevation angles do not make any sense. Where is the Sun? We have too many options. And also, what makes 45 degrees so special? We see that the deviation from the normal seems to increase towards 45 degrees, and then the deviation seems to decrease as we get towards 90 degrees. And the same happens on the other side of the globe. Increase and then decrease. Now, you're all wondering about atmospheric refraction if that has any effect. Well, atmospheric refraction of the light from a star is zero in the zenith, which is point D. Less than one arc a minute at 45 degrees, apparent altitude, that's points B and F. At B and F, we should have less than one arc minute deviation, and still only 5.3 minutes at 10 degrees altitude, it quickly increases as altitude decreases, reaching 10 minutes at 5 degrees, and so on and so forth. 36 uh, arc minutes at the horizon, which is point Z1 and Z2, should have about 36 minutes deviation. On the horizon, refraction is slightly greater than the apparent diameter of the Sun. So when the bottom of the Sun disk appears to touch the horizon, the Sun's true altitude is negative. One arc minute is a very small amount. 36 arc minutes is just over half a degree. Don't forget that our points of interest lie in areas of high temperature on June 21st, so refraction would be negligible. Bear in mind also that the NOAA calculator claims to account for refraction and its values are almost the exact match to the PSA values. However, for the sake of argument, even if we remove 0.6 degrees from each elevation angle, which is the maximum we should remove even for Z1 and Z2, we are still stuck with elevation angles far exceeding and nowhere near converging towards the center of the Sun, which is directly over point D we still cannot form a triangle. Removing 0.6 degrees from each deviation does not fix anything. So where is the Sun? Let's go and have a look at the uh, points Z1 and Z2. Z1 and Z2. We get two divergent answers from the calculators regarding these two points, as you can see here. So according to the NOAA calculator, on the 21st of June at both Z points, we get positive elevation at this time which is about 0.96 in total. The PSA calculator shows a negative total. A good experiment would be to measure these angles in practice. Now, according to NOAA, refraction is taken into account, and therefore, these angles are the real angles and not what is observed. However, it would take 0.96 and divide it by two, that's 0.48 degrees. It is illogical to think that two people on Z1 and Z2 can simultaneously see the center of the sun at 0.48 degrees above the horizon. This is impossible if the Earth is a sphere, and if we only have one Sun. Wikipedia on atmospheric refraction. Sunrise and sunset refer to times at which the Sun's upper limb appears on or disappears from the horizon, and the standard value for the Sun's true altitude is negative 50 arc minutes. The altitude of a celestial body is normally given for the center of the body's disk. Let us now take coins Z1 and Z2 PSA elevation angles, respectively, and find their mean value of this very small angle. We can see that the angle of elevation at these points is less than zero, which means that they join somewhere. And in this example, I'm forcing them to join on the perpendicular at point D. I will not reduce this angle any further by removing 0.59 degrees due to refraction, even if the PSA algorithm does not account for it. I want to give the sun a chance to be as far away as possible. This is the angle, alpha. Angle A is 90 minus the negative angle of elevation at point Z. Using this simple equation, we can find the distance to the sun, which we find to be 148 million kilometers away. And this is very close to the official figure of 152 million kilometers. However, we have to remember that all the other angles at the other points can also now intersect with these elevation trajectories. This results in infinite options for the distance to the Sun as well as a multitude of sizes for it. For example, the elevation angle at G gives a distance to the Sun of around 11 million kilometers. Of course, the PSA algorithm is not physical evidence. What we must understand from this exercise is that if the sum of their real elevation angles at Z1 and Z2 taken simultaneously and refraction corrected is positive, if the sum is positive, then unless we have multiple suns, this is impossible. Also, if the sum of the real elevation angles at Z1 and Z2 is negative, then unless we have multiple suns, this is also impossible because all the other angles intersect, as I have shown. I seriously believe that the PSA angles at Z1 and Z2 are deliberately implanted in order to massage the official distance and size of the sun into the algorithm. I also think that all the other angles are correct, because these algorithms are used to, on a daily basis to guide solar panels toward the Sun. The Z1 and Z2 angles do not affect solar panel declination because at these positions the solar panel mechanisms are inactive, but the real experiment should be carried out. Contrary to the PSA algorithm, the NOAA calculator found here, which claims to include refraction correction, gives us much higher real values for Z1 and Z2. Taking both values and adding them, 
we get 0.96 degrees. For the sake of going to extreme measures to push the sun as far away from us as possible, I will use an elevation angle of 1 degrees at Z1. Even with this extreme angle of 1 degree elevation at Z1 and a deviation angle of 1.85 at point A, a deviation from 22 and a half, which should be the, par the perpendicular. Now we can see that uh, even at this extreme angle, the elevation trajectory from point A will intercept the elevation trajectory from Z1 at about 7,000 kilometers in the X direction and 41,000 kilometers in the Y direction. So roughly here, placing the sun at a distance of 42,000 kilometers and an angle of 80 degrees from the center of the Earth. At least these two elevation angles have a meeting point. Remember, elevation angles are pointing to the center of the sun. So we found one of our suns and we have millions of suns to go. So my conclusion is I started the experiment making only three assumptions. The Earth is round, light travels in straight lines, and that my data is correct. My conclusion is that if the data is correct and light travels in straight lines, then the Earth cannot be a sphere. Otherwise, the trigonometry would work. If, on the other hand, light is bending like a refraction on steroids, then it could work out. Conversely, if it bends in a concave man, we should be witnessing much smaller angles everywhere. My conclusion is that the Earth is not a sphere. Unless someone can show that light bends like a refraction on steroids, or explain the result somehow. Furthermore, what is going on with the 45 degree longitude? If anyone has a theory for why we cannot triangulate the sun using the method described here, please inform. I also have a theory. Maybe the Flat Earth model can explain some things, some of the observations. Now, in the Flat Earth model, when the sun is at point D, a circle the size of the Tropic of Capricorn shown in red can fit perfectly with the sun at its center and cutting the equator at point Z1 and Z2. We already know that at point D we have 90 degree elevation and at the Z1 and Z2 points we have almost zero degrees elevation. We could safely assume that all points on the red circle would have a zero degree elevation. However, we also know that on June 21st the sun shines all over the North Pole and the South Pole is in darkness. Adding points Z3 and Z4, we mark the polar circles. It's easy to see that light from the sun cannot shine evenly in all directions and has to be squashed and twisted to fit our observation. And what happens on December 21st? Can you imagine the sun shining all over the South Pole 24 hours a day? How would that look like? Is our sun a shapeshifter? It is logical to think that the sunlight is creating uneven shapes on a flat surface, and therefore there is no point trying to make any further investigation into this model. It's obviously a joke. There is another model. It's called the concave Earth model, which makes more sense when you acknowledge that light bends upwards. In the concave model, everything makes more sense. The sun seems to have only one position in the sky, but only when you take into account the bending of light. Unlike the flat model and convex model, here we can also understand why the 45 degree longitude is so special, because 45 degree is the midpoint between curved light and straight light. So there is a steady acceleration in elevation from zero degrees longitude, where elevation is just over zero, until 45 degree longitude. And then there is a steady deceleration in elevation until 90 degree longitude, where the elevation is exactly equal to the longitude. It makes sense. The points marked Z1 and Z2 also make sense now. The concave model allows for both of them to receive illumination, without the problems of the convex model, where we can't find the sun. This should place the sun at just over 2,700 kilometers as a rough estimate. So in conclusion, I started this experiment making only three assumptions. The Earth is round, light travels in straight lines, and my data is correct. My conclusion is that if the data is correct and light can be proven to bend in a concave manner, then the Earth can very well be a concave sphere. If on the other hand light is straight or is bending like a refraction of steroids, then we have to look elsewhere. My conclusion is that the Earth is not concave unless someone can prove that light bends in a concave manner. So you can check out this website. Even if light bends in a concave manner, meaning from the ground upwards or away from the normal of its source, like so. Even then, research is needed and mathematics have to be involved in order to measure accurately where the sun actually is in its distance and its size. You can already begin to think the consequences of this, the implications are immense. Can you even begin to imagine what this means if it is true? The whole universe would be contained within the 27,000 kilometers circumference of the Earth. And you can forget all about that big bang stuff. Go and do some measurements and experiments yourselves. The autumnal equinox is approaching. Do the math for your longitude. So. I wish to thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you found this information useful and educational, make sure you check out the following websites and YouTube. I'm not affiliated with any of these sources. Thanks also to the image providers for making this educational video possible. God bless you.